Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lisa Ammon and I serve as membership chair of the Louisville Forum. We meet on the second Wednesday of each month at Vincenzo's Restaurant at noon. The Louisville Forum is a nonpartisan public issues group founded in 1984. The forum hosts debates and discussions of contemporary and sometimes controversial public policy issues that affect the greater Louisville community. Although we may take up a national issue, we try to always put a local spin on it. So for more information on the forum, visit our website at louisvilleforum.org. Even before the controversial disqualification of maximum security in the 145th Kentucky Derby, the safety of the thoroughbred racing was under the microscope and the sport was making changes. Today we have expert panelists to discuss the challenges and changes in the industry. I would like to introduce our three panelists today. We have Donna Barton Brothers, who's NBC horse racing analyst and a former jockey, Steve Koch, Executive Director of the National Thoroughbred Racing Association Safety and Integrity Alliance, and Eric Hamelback, CEO of the National Horsemen's Benevolent and Protective Association. First, we will have Donna speak with us. Donna Barton Brothers is most recognizable for her coverage of horse racing on NBC Sports, but her involvement in horse racing has been a lifelong passion. Her mother, Patty Barton, was one of the first dozen women to be licensed as a jockey in the United States. She retired in 1984 as a leading female jockey in the nation with just over 1,200 wins. As Donna Barton, Donna rode in races from 1987 to 1998 and retired in 1998 as the second leading female jockey in the United States by money earned. She won 1,130 races. She's been covering horse racing for NBC Sports since 2000, covering multiple Triple Crown races, Breeders' Cup championships, also show jumping, bull riding, and other horse sports. Brothers is also an author and wrote Inside Track, Insider's Guide to Horse Racing, a book intended to bridge the gap between the novice horse racing fan and the at times complicated sport of horse racing. She also serves as Chief Operating Officer for Starlight and Star Ladies Racing. Her husband, Frank Brothers, is a bloodstock agent and is also a member of the yearling selection team for Keeneland Sales. Please welcome Donna. Thank you. So I guess we start with uh, some opening remarks and I have a feeling everybody in the room wants to discuss this disqualification, <laughs> maybe even ad nauseum. We'll get to that. But by a show of hands, could I ask how many people prior to the Kentucky Derby were familiar with what was happening at Santa Anita with the catastrophic injuries to the horses? So most of you. So that's the thing that I'm going to spend my first three or four minutes talking about. And then by all means, I'll field all questions about the disqualification uh, that you have. But the thing that I, I namely want to address, and, and first of all, I do realize we have members of the media here today, and that's wonderful, since I'm one of the members of the media. My only uh, request would be that I'm fine to be quoted on anything I say. I would only ask that it not be taken out of context. So um, what happened at Santa Anita was a confluence of events that uh, the horses paid a pretty high price for. And so at the end of it all, and in the aftermath of a lot of uh, fatalities, Santa Anita made some sweeping changes because they were under a tremendous amount of pressure from the general public um, and the, um, the uh, constituents, the population in California to make some changes. And so they made changes to racing medication and use of a riding crop and notification of uh, if you were gonna work your horse, which means train them at about race speed in the morning. They, horsemen usually do that about every five to 10 days with horses in preparation for the races. Uh, veterinary examinations. When the reality is that 90, I would say, percent of their problems stem from the track that from the fact that the racetrack had gotten away from them. And so the racetrack at Santa Anita is designed to handle typical Southern California weather where it rains about once in a blue moon and you have beautiful sunny skies most of the time and temperatures don't dip below freezing ever. And then in about a six month period, what happened was they had way more rain than historically they had ever had out there <clears throat> and that that track had ever seen 
They had temperatures that dipped, if not below freezing, certainly <clears throat> to freezing at times. And so there were times when speculated that the track may have been freezing in spots. And so one of the worst things that you can do is have a racetrack that's not consistent because it's very difficult for a horse to maintain soundness without having consistent footing throughout. And then the third thing that happened at that same time was they'd let their longtime track man, Dennis Moore, go. Um, and so a few months into it, when things started to get really bad, they brought Dennis Moore back on. And, and so initially they had a team of people who weren't used to dealing with that racetrack surface and with any of these weather conditions, trying to fix a problem. And they didn't, they were, they, they didn't really know what to do about it, especially given the fact that the rain just wouldn't stop and the freezing temperatures or the cold temperatures wouldn't let up. And so Dennis Moore came back on. Uh, Dr. Mick Peterson, who's based here in Kentucky, uh, also went out there and worked with him. And what they ultimately decided to do is add more dirt to the track, also known as cushion, to the track. And it alleviated... Uh, the problems a great deal. And so a lot of the other changes that they are still talking about implementing, maybe they will, maybe they won't, but I think given the fact that adding dirt to the track, alleviating pretty much 99% uh, of the problems indicates that the main problem all along was dirt. But having said that, and I don't think I have a lot more time to speak, um, you know, we always want to protect our horses. Uh, people who are involved with horse racing get up seven days a week and go to the barn, most of them at least 360 days a year. And so you have to love the horses in, in order to, we, we don't even call it work, in order to have a lifestyle that involves seven days a week of being at the barn and working with the horses. And so the last thing anybody involved with horse racing ever wants to have happen is any sort of a, a injury to the horses, particularly a catastrophic injury. And so it was heartbreaking to the people involved with horse racing, and it's good to know that Santa Anita did a lot of things to address it and that that track is much safer now. And I think that's about all I have to say about that, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions as we go along, and I know our two other speakers have some opening remarks too. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Okay, our next speaker is Steve Koch. He took over as executive director of the National Thoroughbred Racing Association Safety and Integrity Alliance in April 2015. Koch previously served 12 years as Canada's Woodbine Racetrack, where he was vice president of racing from 2008 to 2015. As vice president of racing, he oversaw all aspects of thoroughbred racing product, as well as the company's racing surfaces, grounds, stables, and fleet divisions. From 2003 to 2008, his Woodbine career included Director of Racing and Director of Backstretch Operations. Prior to Woodbine, Coke worked at Keeneland in Lexington, Kentucky, and he was raised as a horseman at Claiborne Farm in Paris, Kentucky. He holds a Master of Science from the University of Kentucky. Please welcome Steve. It really is a pleasure to be here today. Um, Actually, following Donna turns out to work very, very well for me because I was going to also comment on Santa Anita. And what we're seeing as Santa Anita right now is an interesting parallel to something we were experiencing 10 years ago as a horse racing industry. So if you think back 10 years, um, since we're all in Louisville, we can remember a horse like um, <clears throat> Eight Bells in the Kentucky Derby. Um, we can remember Barbaro, that magnificent animal that got injured in the Preakness Stakes. We had a series of high-profile incidents in the 2006-2008 period, they created this moment <clears throat> where our public, our own industry stakeholders, our government's asking some very hard questions about our business, and we need to answer these questions, demonstrate that horse racing uh, treats its horses and its participants very well, and what can we do to drive continuous improvement, get better and better, and be more uh, completely responsible to these animals. So that's a time that um, where awareness happens, this re-energy uh, this awareness happens where um, uh, horsemen, regulators, racetrack operators are, are um, renewing their uh, thought process. What are the next important things that we can do to get better? And so a host of industry initiatives are born at the time that includes the Safety and Integrity Alliance. And 
what we do is we have a code of safety and integrity standards. And this is actually an interesting um, little document. Actually, it's not a little document. It's a significant document. It exists at our website, ntraalliance.com. It's worth a look for anybody that's halfway interested in horse racing. It's not a bad 101 on the basics of opening a racetrack. And we hold racetracks accountable to this code of standards. The code of standards continuously evolve, evolves through a, a board and industry process. The racetracks are held accountable to that code of standards every two years, the participating racetracks. And what we are doing is driving that continuous improvement. And we're driving the continuous improvement because we are implementers. We are implementing the newest science, the newest right way to do things, the newest um, best practice rules for the industry, whatever the flavor of the day may be. And what we've done in that 10 years, not just because of the alliance, but we're very proud to uh, play an important role there as implementers, what we've achieved in that 10 years is um, we have metrics now. We have a metric that we know that we've driven uh, racehorse injuries, such as what we've talked about at Santa Anita just now. We've driven racehorse injuries in that 10 years down 20%, those rates down 20%. And this comes from that renewed awareness, that, then that constant uh, awareness, and it comes with that continuous improvement. And what we've managed in the last 10 years is remarkable. We are way more scientifically uh, knowledgeable in um, the mechanics of our racing surfaces and how we maintain those surfaces. We've tripled down in the areas of medication research, illicit substance research, the consistency of our performance uh, testing laboratories. Um, we've gotten, in fact, one of our biggest success stories in the horse business, no doubt Eric, this is something Eric's going to touch, down, uh, touch on, is how responsible we are to the um, second careers for our racehorses. When a racehorse is done uh, racing and training, what is its next career? And there's a remarkable market for those horses nowadays. So those are things that have happened in the 10 years, thinking back to a time that parallels our right now, discussing Santa Anita this spring. And then we come to Santa Anita, and it's been interesting to watch the, again, um, this, this actually new opportunity because yes we had a series of high profile incidents at Santa Anita and we darn well better respond to them because we owe that to our horses, we owe that to our horsemen, we owe that to our participants such as the jockeys and the uh, uh, stable staff and we owe it to the public. The public demands that we are treating these people and horses right and what I, we have seen at Santa Anita is yes we doubled back down on the race surface, what do we need to know what's going on here but we didn't stop there. This industry is uh, in a rapid way um, especially rapid for what is otherwise a slow changing business, we are rolling out um, tremendous new ideas that are having a clear impact as we speak out at Santa Anita. So the Alliance is very happy to be an implementer of these things. I'm very happy to hopefully provide some thoughtful insight to your questions today that no doubt will um, pivot back to these things if we um, are able to all conclude that um, uh, the stewards did a good job at the Kentucky Derby. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve. I just want to make note that there are questions in the center of, your, center of your table. So if you have questions for our panelists as we go along, I encourage you to write them down. And Tony Kahn's, our board member, and Keith Larson will be collecting the questions for you. So our third panelist is Eric Hamelback. He's the CEO of the National Horsemen's Benevolent and Protective Association and is the former general manager of Frank Stronach Sedina Springs Farm. He resides in Paris, Kentucky with his wife, Deborah, and two children. Originally from Frierson, Louisiana, he attended Louisiana State University where he graduated in 1993 with a Bachelor of Science in Animal Systems. As CEO of the National Horsemen's Benevolent and Protective Association, Eric serves as a representative for the largest thoroughbred horsemen's group in America and Canada, where he represents horsemen on the American Horse Race, or, I'm sorry, Horse Council Racing Committee, the United Horse Coalition, the RMTC and the NTRA Safety Alliance, the Racing Officials Accreditation Program, as well as an associate member for the Association of Racing Commissioners International. Known as an expert throughout the thoroughbred racing industry, Eric has invited and testified twice before members and committees of the United States Congress, and his opinion is often sought after regarding federal issues pertaining to the thoroughbred racing industry. Please welcome Eric. Thank you, Lisa. I want to, want to thank Lisa and Dan for um, stirring up the most controversial 
Derby in history and then bringing us here. I really appreciate that. Uh, uh, but hello, everyone. Um, I, I thank you uh, for allowing me to be here today. Um, my first point of business is I would have to assume most of you in this room don't know what the Horseman's Representative Group does or who they represent. So I have brought some flyers on the corner of the table over here, so please feel free to take some. So the National HBPA has 30 affiliates uh, throughout the United States and Canada, and I act as the representative voice, like a trade association, for all the licensed owners and trainers within those affiliates. Um, I act on matters that are important to the positive advancement and the promotion of thoroughbred racing, again, both on the federal and state level. It's my job to work for and encourage continuing education and the highest standards of horsemanship, which will in turn prove to give us the best care, safety, and obviously health for both our equine athletes and our human athletes. We also actively educate and assist in programs concerning aftercare, uh, as Steve touched on a little bit, and also I've brought on the corner of the table over here the TAA magazine. Uh, it's very important to us as horsemen that we know the second career of our athletes leaving the racetrack are able to go into a second career. As a longtime polo player, played a lot of thoroughbreds off the racetrack, and I think that's an important part of our business model these days. So, so, so I really encourage you to pick up a magazine and learn about the TAA. So what are some of the examples that we're doing? Uh, so I'm on the RMTC board, lots of acronyms, uh, both here in our world and in DC. So the Racing Medication and Testing Consortium uh, is one example. Very recently, we had concerns with the multiple medication violation system, um, and there were some legal challenges. And so a group of us and the board of the RMTC got together um, along with the ARCI officials and we were able to institute new changes and now we're seeing that adopted through many more jurisdictions than previous. I also work with the ARCI, the Association of Racing Commissioners International, as an associate member and a committee advisor for the model rules. We take in part rule modifications, uh, additions and then ultimately implementations. Um, very recently, one that's been high profile is the void claim rule. I was on the subcommittee that established the void claim rule for the ARCI and ultimately adopted uh, at their board meeting. I also advocate for establishing of screening limits and also the protection of legal rights for horsemen. So I'm also on the rope board. So the Racing Officials Accreditation Program, along with my friend Terry Birch, here from the University of Louisville, high profile right now uh, with the stewards. Um, but I work in particularly with the CE courses, uh, in particular, most recently, uh, working to educate stewards on environmental and incidental contamination positives that we see popping up, which can cause an adverse analytical positive in our world and making sure that we understand where those contaminations came from. Um, I've also worked on and crafted and hopefully trying to propose a stewards advisory and review committee. Now I've already been receiving calls would that committee that I'm trying to set up involve what happened on Saturday and the answer is no. Um, the proposal for this committee is to look at uh, challenges in medication positives. So as a stakeholder, the National HBPA has always been focused on how to implement solid industry safety welfare recommendations and then put those into a uniform national body within the rules process. And that's what we're constantly striving for. The National HBPA strongly ad advocates for research towards understanding and reducing injuries as well as equine health. We are constantly promoting education and preventative medicine along with responsible training for our equine athletes. And I'm certain we'll get some questions. Now you can see why I wrote a book about all these legal terms and all the <laughs> This complicated language we have, right? Thank you, Eric. Sorry. 
Yes, thank you, Eric. And now we'll start the question portion. Keith, you're up first. Yes, uh, <clears throat> this question is for all the panelists. What possibility or probability would you give of a National Thoroughbred Racing Association being formed? And what potential reforms or would they take and what form would that board actually take? You guys go ahead. Um, <laughs> uh, some interesting wording on that question. I'd say it's 100% that there's a National <laughs> Thoroughbred Racing Association form because that's who I work for. Um, but maybe, maybe that's we're in the weeds on that. The, I think the, the point of the question is um, some central federal uh, entity think of a commissioner for horse racing. That's a super complicated thing. Yeah, sure, it, perhaps it can happen in the future. We're nowhere close to that right now. Is it the right thing for our industry? That's something we're going to debate for a long time. But in the short run, what holds us up from that is, I think first we have to acknowledge that horse racing as a sport is the most highly regulated sport um, uh, there is. Um, I, I, I think I can say that without challenge. Um, in the U.S., uh, we are um, regulated. We have 34 jurisdictions that raise horses, and we each jurisdiction has a state regulatory agency that sets and enforces the rules for horse racing. So when we're talking about a national federal oversight bill, uh, body or a commissioner of sorts, we are asking each state to give up a certain amount of its regulatory control to a federal entity. And so now you're headed into a very, very complicated question that's going to take some uh, great, uh, some minds that are greater than mine on the legal and politics and how to ever get there. Um, so asking to put a percentage chance on it, I'm, I just can't do that. I think it's going to be a lot of hard work if we ever get there. I don't really care to address that because I think you addressed it perfectly. <laughs> Uh, and I agree with Steve um, at the, and Donna that he addressed it well. Uh, I just want to make a comparison that most people don't realize. There's a lot of, there's a lot of call and ask for a, a, a commissioner of sorts in thoroughbred racing. Um, and often I get frustrated when we are compared to the NFL or the NBA where you have 30 owners. Okay, we'll have 30 owners on a race day. So to get representation that's what I'm here for. That's what the legal horseman's representative group does. We are not a paid dues membership organization. We are a democratic organization. We are elected officials, and we are there to represent that jurisdiction. Um, I don't think we get enough credit for the uniformity that we have, and it's when you consider a commission type or a, a league office type, that's what the Association of Racing Commissioners International is. Now, the Constitution is very clear on Tenth Amendment state rights, and that's why we have a commission within each of the jurisdictions that are currently racing. Are there a little bit of variations between some of the rules? There are. There are variations in the speed limits in each state, but there's no variation when it comes to driving under the influence. So my point is, every commission is 100% lockstep in that it is illegal to have a performance enhancing medication in your horse. And there are many other policies that we can equate that to, but to have a single unified commission that oversees the industry, I don't think is achievable, but I don't think is necessary. The Interstate Horse Racing Act is very clear. Who controls thoroughbred racing? the Horseman's Representative Group, the Racing Commission, and the Track Ownership. Thank you. Uh, so this one, it just says for all, and it, the question is, do you foresee a change in whips on the racetrack? I think I'll address that one. Uh, and the quick answer is yes, and there already has been one. Uh, we had so many things to talk about at this year's Oaks and Derby that one of the things we didn't get to talk about very much, Jerry Bailey and Randy Moss addressed it around race six on Derby Day, is that, um, so we've already made some progress. We went from having a, a riding crop that just had a leather popper on the end that didn't have any real, the length of the whip was, um, had to be standard. I, I can't remember what the length is, but it has to fit within a standard length. But the, the popper itself didn't have much standardization, and also there were leather strips near the, the popper itself that also didn't have much standardization. And so a few years ago, we went to what we call cushion crop, 
which this uh, leather ended up being more padded and more forgiving, let's say. But I, I for one, didn't think it was good enough yet because I felt like it still could potentially hurt a horse if it was hit too often in the same place. So I think they're, I, I know for a fact that their hides are much thicker than ours. And so do I feel like we're really hurting the horses when we use the riding crop? No. But if you repeatedly were to hit a horse in the same place with the riding, with the cushion crop that we've used, sure, it could cause a, a, a bit of a sting. Having said that, I think it's been proven that horses don't run into pain. So if their leg hurts, they slow down. If they hit their tooth in the starting gate and knock it out, they don't run their race because their tooth hurts. And so there's no advantage <clears throat> actually to causing, to, to whipping a horse so much that you actually did cause pain in any portion of their body because it wouldn't make them run faster, it would make them slow down. However, all of that said, Ramon Dominguez, who's a retired rider in the Hall of Fame, came out with a new riding crop very recently, and it's called the 360 GT. It's named the 360 because the popper itself is a tubular design. Think of a pool noodle that you see kids hitting their, each other upside the head with. And also it's GT for gentle touch because it's that same sort of fabric as a pool noodle or a Nerf ball. And so that's the new popper on the end of the riding crops. And I think we've come a long way. Uh, as a society, we've come a long way with all animals. Uh, most of our dogs lived outside 50 years ago, right? Our dogs are inside now, and we want to be more compassionate to all of our animals, and the horses are included. And at some point, the jockeys, the horsemen said, wait a second, if there's any way that the riding crop we're using is hurting the horse, let's not use it because horses aren't going to learn that way. We want them to enjoy the experience. And so the riding crop ideally is used in the same way a personal fitness trainer would be used. Olympic level athletes have personal fitness trainers. And so when a jockey's going through that final part of the race, the jockey is up there to say, come on, buddy, I know you're getting tired, so am I, but I need you to keep trying. Not only that, the horses have no idea where the finish line is. You do, the jockey does, the horse doesn't. And so the riding crop is another way of saying, we're not there yet, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> and also if they start to bear out to the right to just say, no, 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 buddy, don't go that way, go straight. And then they bear to the left, nope, not that way either, go straight. And so 100% of the riders used Ramon's uh, 360 GT in the Kentucky Oaks. And I was really proud of the jockeys for that because it was not mandated, but the Jockeys Guild decided to embrace this and say, you know what, we care about the horses and, and we don't want to hurt them. And so if there's a possibility that repeated strikes could hurt them, we don't want to do it. And I believe 100% of the riders rode with it in the Kentucky Derby, but I haven't been able to confirm that yet. But I do know that it's been mandated in Maryland, and 100% of the riders will be using it in 100% of the races, and it is huge progress for the racing industry for the riding crop. Uh, well, I would just like to um, add to that. Obviously, Donna is the expert, um, but I would say that from other equestrian sports. Uh, I'm a longtime polo player, and what other equestrian sports have to their advantage is leg cues. Um, and if you've ever had the opportunity to ride a racehorse, and when I was much younger and much thinner and much less heavy, um, I used to break yearlings. And I'm telling you, when your legs are up that high, there are no such thing as leg cues. But Using the crop, I would also say, with the incident that happened in the Derby, I would like to think that Gabrielle in particular, if Luis. he had, I'm sorry, Luis had not had his crop to help the horse, he may have gone further than he actually did. Um, and when you can tap a horse on the shoulder with your crop and get him in line, it is an extremely important and safe thing to have in your hand. We've also had extreme advancements under ROPE, uh, the Racing Officials Accreditation Program, with what is now called the three-strike rule. Um, it's, it's judged by the same stewards that made the call on Saturday to make sure every jockey doesn't hit the horse more than three times in succession. Um, that is being adopted widely throughout the United States and Canada. Steve has a lot of experience at that with his position at Woodbine. So again, we are constantly moving forward with safety 
and making sure that it is also seen in the public eye. Some people want us to ban the whip, the crop completely, and I understand that mentality, but I also would encourage you to understand it is a safety measure as well. Yeah, I just want to say one more thing. I'm sorry, Steve, about that. I'm really glad Eric brought that up because <clears throat> I am not an advocate for riding horses without a riding crop. And if, in fact, they took the riding crop away, exactly what Eric was saying would have to happen. The jockey stirrups would have to drop because they're going to have to have some sort of ability to control the horse. And so they would have to go to leg cues. And then we would look like we were in the 1850s, where all the jockeys were riding with long stirrups, sitting straight up in the saddle. And I think Luis Saez was a perfect example the other day when maximum security ducked out. If you watch those replays carefully, he's pulling on his left rein and slapping that horse on the shoulder with the with the riding crop saying no not that way and it would have taken a lot more time to correct him without the riding crop on this side sorry Steve. Um, I won't I won't comment necessarily on where we're headed with the whip but it's it's um, I view our uh, horse racing business through a lens of social license and that social license is, um, you know, are we responsible to the horse, our stakeholders, our riders, in such a way that the public uh, agrees that uh, we are responsible and putting on a good product that deserves our support. And so as I think about the industry in that way, and I recognize that it's hard, these uh, uh, explanations, descriptions that Eric and Donna just gave actually are, are, are are fantastic and helpful, but that was a long message, right? And so how do we message that? How do we explain that to our public? But I, my point is there's a ton of energy in this discussion, and that is a signal to people like me that um, our entire industry is engaged in the concept of social license, even if they don't know that we use that term social license. So I would encourage at least everybody um, appreciate the energy. This, con this discussion has energy, and I get energy that we are having the discussion. So I actually look at these um, conversations not as negative conversations. I think it's highly positive, and I think it demonstrates that um, we do absolutely care and want the very best. This is for any of the panelists. Uh, please share your thoughts on use of Lasix. Are there any safer or similar products that we could be using? Eric. It goes to the horseman. Um, the utilization of Lasix is obviously extremely polarizing, otherwise you probably wouldn't have asked that question. Um, I would say up front that I am an advocate for the utilization of Lasix as it is stated by the Association of Equine Practitioners. What is most important to me is equine health and welfare. And when you look at who is the gold standard of taking care of the equine health and their welfare, it's the, it's the veterinary leadership. The Association of Equine Practitioners is who we look for, look to. In that, currently, utilization four hours out of Lasix, I personally take Lasix every day for high blood pressure, is what is best and scientifically proven over and over again to combat either, either lessen the severity of or completely eliminate an episode of EIPH. Exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage is a problem in racehorses. It is a problem in humans. And what we have now is a medication that has been tried, true, researched over and over to help mitigate those circumstances and the severity of EIPH. Is there another product? There is not another product that has been efficaciously proven to work as effective as furosemide. There are other products out there that are utilized. Europe, in particular, has quite a few homeopathics. Um, there are other products that have been researched here, but they end up having a stimulant and an amphetamine in them. So none of those we could utilize. Now, there's plenty of other products when I was a kid on the racetrack that we utilized. Tramadol, uh, Amacar, Ergonavine, Robinol. Um, I'm sorry, I said Tramadol. I just had my knees replaced. I meant, uh, I meant Trental. Um, all of those products were utilized when I was on the racetrack. We, we can't use those anymore. We can only utilize Lasix. Now, what I would like to say that continually, and especially here in the Courier Journal, gets put out that it is only used in the United States. 
I'm telling you on TV that is completely a fallacy. It is used, I would tell you, more often in the international markets, but they do not use it on race day. Again, science has proven to us utilizing it four hours out, no longer has the ability to mask any medications, another fallacy that continues to be put in the press, done at the University of Kentucky at the Gluck Equine Center. The reason it's given by third party at four hours out is because of that. 80% of horses, when you look at a study done in South Africa, will suffer an EIPH episode up to three races. So it's a problem. We have a health and welfare issue. We utilize a medication. I know it's polarizing, and unfortunately it, it has been put into the press, and I've been accused by Congress of doping horses. And I take offense to that because we are anything but abusive to our horses. And so we utilize that medication to the best of our ability, the way the veterinary world tells us to do it, and that's why we utilize it on race day. And until the science proves that that's not the best thing to do, we'll continue to advocate for that. Will there be a change? We'll see. Horsemen adapt, that's what we do. But if we're gonna stand by the equine health and welfare, then we're gonna stand by the utilization of Lasix at four hours out right now, the research tells us so. Anybody else, or I can move on? Uh, yeah, I'll address that. Um, I'm going to just be devil's advocate for a minute. Uh, so I, I can't necessarily say that I'm anti-LASIX, but I'll give you the flip side of it. So the argument against LASIX is that, is there a possibility that the use of LASIX has caused, caused some dehydration in horses and weakening of the bone? It's probably not possible that that could happen in a horse's lifetime. But it may be possible that the widespread use of Lasix is causing us to breed more and more horses who are prone to EIPH. And so there's definitely an argument for that, that, that there's a possibility we are creating a bigger storm than, than we would have otherwise had. Uh, the other thing I'd like to bring up is that things are different in Europe and more than the ways that Eric mentioned. They also train for the most part in yards. So they have these big grassy areas and they don't have the contained environments that we have that are pretty much contaminated with dust and uh, different air pollutants that horses in Europe aren't exposed to. And so there's also a possibility that we have a higher rate of EIPH prone horses just because of the environment in which they live. But the last thing I'll bring up on that is that one of the disappointing aspects of this for people who would like to see Lasix go away is that in the, in the presence of Lasix, there's no incentive for anybody to come up with a natural cure because they're not going to be able to, because EI, I mean, Lasix is effective. It's effective for the treatment of EIPH. And so no natural cure will ever be brought up while Lasix is around. So people who would like to see Lasix go away say, well, if you got rid of Lasix, then maybe somebody would come up with something. But I will say that in the meantime, horses would suffer because we do have horses who bleed. And so to ever think that we could just t take horses who have been, that we have either made Lasix dependent or they are Lasix dependent, and then just broad brush take them all off of Lasix, that actually would be more cruel than not using Lasix. Just to quickly underscore one of the points um, that, uh, first of all, I work for a very diverse board with diverse interests, so you're unlikely to get me to take strong positions. Um, I'm here, I implement what is our new best practices in science, but something within what Eric said is very important to me is that um, Lasix is a uh, highly regulated in its use on race day, and other than Lasix, the horses going to our starting gates do not have medications in them. Our horses are not doped. Um, and we talk about uniformity, that is a uh, uh, uniformity that we have. When the horses go to the starting gate, we have been clear for at least 24 hours, and sometimes in, all, in almost all cases an awful lot more, depending on the substance you're talking about. Lasix is highly regulated. All right, so um, the question about 
the Derby. I've got several of them. I'm going to do my best to condense them, and if you can try to take apart which ones you want. First of all, this was directly for Donna. They just would like to have your perspective as a jockey as to what happened at the race, okay? And then there are other ones re regarding to safety. Um, do you think the disqualification decision in the Derby was influenced by heightened concern about safety? And would the decision would have been different last year? And then several about the field of horses. Should it be reduced from 20 to 14? If you guys can take a stab at that. All right, I'll take, uh, I'll try to make a quick stab at all of that. Um, so first of all, yeah, I feel like uh, my opinion is it was 100% the right decision. I was standing there, uh, had interviewed Luis Saez immediately after the race. And obviously at that time, we didn't know that there was a jockey's objection or a steward's inquiry. And if we did know, I wouldn't have been able to or been allowed to detain the jockey for an interview. He would have had to go right back. So the jockey's objection didn't happen until after that interview. Um, and so when I came back, I got off my horse. I started watching the replay. Within a few minutes, I said to my colleague, Lafitte Pinkai, that number's coming down. And he said, then what's taking so long? And I said, because they, they can't decide who all he bothered and where those horses finished. And so that's what took so long in the aftermath. I don't think it was uh, the, the decision to take the horse down, I, and I hate to say it, but was essentially a no-brainer because horses do veer sharply left, sharply right, sometimes leaving the starting gate, and there's not a lot a jockey can do to keep that from happening other than immediately try to straighten them up. And the reason why the numbers don't come down when it happens at the starting gate very often is because the logic is that the horses then have the whole rest of the race to make up for whatever interference they may have experienced right at the start of the race. Uh, and given the fact that it's really hard to prevent, it, it, I think it's a logical position. But after the race starts, when you are running the race, you have to maintain a straight course or stay in your lane unless you're clear. So you can go all the way from the two path to the 12 path if nobody else is in between you and the 12 path. But if there are other horses between you and the 12 path, you have to stay in your lane. And so by no fault of the jockeys, Luis Saez is, he said to me after the race, he's a young horse and he's spooked and that's exactly what happened. This horse had only started four times prior. He had certainly never seen a crowd like that before. It, it would appear that he turned for, started to turn for home. They were still sort of in the middle of the turn. And that crowd noise the jockeys have told me about is deafening. They said that when you turn for home, it's like you hit a wall of noise. And maximum security literally looked like he hit a wall of something because he went from the two path to the five path abruptly. Now you slow that down, it doesn't look like it was that abrupt. And then people go, oh, well, look, uh, Tyler Gaffleone on War Will didn't even stop riding. He actually did stop riding. But when you slow it down, it looks like everybody has more time to react. In a split second, what happened was in a fraction of a second, Luis Saez's horse ducked out sharply to the right interfered with at least three other horses in the race. He quickly corrected his horse and then went about his course. That's why I don't think Luis Saez should receive a jockey suspension for that or be fined. I feel like he did all he could. But absolutely, the horse had to come down. And then the next rule of racing is that you have to place the horse behind whoever he interfered with. And in this case, that lowest placed horse was the number 18 long range toddy. And so they had to put him in 18th. Um, do I think field size for the Kentucky Derby should be reduced? I don't think it's going to happen, so I'm not going to say it should. One of the things that I think that could improve it and would not have helped at all in this situation is um, I think it's possible that Churchill Downs could invest in a 20-horse starting gate. They are out there. Uh, they use them in, in some other countries, and so that might help some of the stuff that happens at the start of the race. And also, if we do have a full field of 20 horses, the one wouldn't the horse in the number one post position wouldn't be as compromised. Uh, currently, the way the gate sits and the way the track lays out, if we have a 20 horse field, the horse in the one post position is headed straight for the inside rail within about three jumps. And so it compromises the one's position. And I don't know if there are more questions, but I'll let Steve and Eric talk. <laughs> I just want to address the um, one aspect of that question, was this different on Derby Day than any other day? Um, I personally am as well traveled as anybody you're going to meet in North American horse racing. I'm routinely engaging with 40 different racetracks and I've been to all of them and um, uh, they are my clients and when I go to these racetracks I see their operations in a very deep way and therefore I'm engaged very deeply with their stewards. 
Um, I can say unequivocally, Butch Breedcraft, Barb Borden, and Tyler Picklesheimer, the three stewards that were in the stand on Derby Day, are at the very top of North America's uh, stewards colony. They are the very best, the very brightest, and um, uh, 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 have had excellent careers. I can say without any doubt that they adjudicate the Kentucky Derby like they did the fourth race on a Thursday afternoon in that, that they are there to enforce two things with a steward's judgment, the integrity of the race and the safety of the race. And it's clear to me at this time that the judgment they made were to preserve those two things. And on that afternoon, um, last weekend, they got it right. The other thing that you heard is, um, uh, there were many calling for some more transparency in the uh, decision on that race. Um, uh, the stewards should be available to media and should answer questions, et cetera. Um, that would be an interesting precedent that I don't know of any other sport having ever done. If you can imagine a NFL referee heading off to the press conference after <laughs> that last second passing interference call, um, I think it would be an interesting scenario. <laughs> Well, I appreciate that, and as it, you may remember, I'm from Louisiana, so yeah, I'm a huge Saints fan. I'm still a remorse <laughs> over that, but I'm also a football official, right? So I, I officiate football here in the state. Um, but to address the, the safety, um, I also agree that the stewards definitely made the right call. Um, I, will, I will stand behind that, again, using an, uh, another equestrian sport, the line uh, the line in polo, everything is revolved around safety. And that line was broken. Um, and again, the, the, the jock did the best he could, but circumstances had already evolved, and I think the right call was made, and I, I do stand with the steward's decision. Um, and as Steve alluded to, I definitely think not only last year's derby, um, but last week's races, you know, that call should have and should be called on every race. Um, I certainly believe that where you are in the race sometimes will have an effect on what the stewards rule. Uh, again, whether you're, as Donna mentioned, breaking from the starting gate, when you have the whole race left to get back into position and to make your best run, uh, this, this instance happened coming out of the third turn or going into the fourth turn, however you want to describe it. But as Donna said, the, that wall, if you have, I'm sure most of you have been to the Derby, but that's an experience these horses have never had before, right? It's the first time. Um, and with respect to the number of horses in the race, I, I wouldn't have an opinion. I wouldn't voice an opinion. I think that as long as safety is upheld, um, and certainly in other countries, they run with more than 20 horses in a race. So uh, I'm, I'm in favor of any aspect as long as the safety of the horse and rider are taken into play first. I'll just say one more thing about the field size because um, none of the riders have ever said to me that they feel like the field size should be reduced. It's certainly not something that the derby jockeys are complaining about uh, for the Kentucky Derby. Everybody's happy to to be there if they can be there. And so I have had one person say, well, that race should be adjudicated differently because there's so many horses and there's gonna be bumping. Well, actually it should be adjudicated more stringently than if that's the case because there was a potential for more danger because if that horse would have fallen, imagine the aftermath of that. And so would the decision have been different a year ago before the Santa Anita stuff? I don't think so. This wasn't about let's show that we're trying to be safer than ever. This was let's show we're doing the same thing on Wednesday that we do or on Derby that we do on Wednesday. Okay, Keith, I think we have time for one more question. We've received some questions about uh, jockey safety. What can be done, and this is for all the panelists, what can be done to reduce the frequency of concussions suffered by jockeys? That's a great question. I had seven concussions, broke my nose seven times. Apparently I was a little top heavy. I only broke my collarbone once, nothing else. Just here, uh, that was it. Um, and uh, I, I don't know that there's much that can be done to reduce the chance that you're going to hit your head, but helmets are certainly improving. One of the things I wish I would have known when I was a jockey that they've just found out recently is that every time a jockey does have a fall and hits their head, that helmet should be replaced. I used the same helmet for 20 years. 
Um, and so my helmets should have been replaced regularly, and they're finding these things out now, and, and certainly those things are improving, and Steve knows way more about the improvements that they're making in that aspect than, than anybody in the room. Yeah, this is, um, we should, probably should have just started with this question, then I could okay. have spent an hour at the microphone, so I'll do my best just to um, boil it down to something simple. I, I think a, first of all, it's, it's the low-hanging fruit is not um, removing the incidents. Uh, concussions are going to happen. You hit your head, you're going to get a concussion. Right now, that's where our science is at. It's more about what can we do to prevent the incident in the first place. So what are the low-hanging, um, um, you know, the solvable, uh, unsolved problems that, that uh, 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 climax into a concussion incident. Uh, it's about helmet research, which now we're headed into a deeply scientific rabbit hole, so I'll spare you that, but they are coming along tremendously. Um, and it is once a jockey does hit his head and get a concussion that we manage that concussion. We don't just send him. He hits his head in the fourth and we send him back out to, for the fifth because the show must go on. That's not acceptable. And so um, there are Actually, there's an individual in Maryland, her name's Dr. Kelly Ryan, and I have <laughs> on the air described her as uh, the uh, patron saint of jockeys. And um, first time I said it, I was trying to be clever, but actually, you know, we, we quickly realized this, this is it. She is the, the front, uh, the, the leading edge of looking out for our jockeys and making concussion awareness and management and return to ride protocols. Uh, a critical component, and it is the things that she has created in Maryland for Maryland horse racing that it then becomes my job at the Safety and Integrity Alliance to start implementing around the country. And that is a, a work in progress. I anticipate actually in the next um, 30 days, the Code of Standards likely is finally gonna hold a chapter on this and we're going to, we're already implementing the things Kelly, Dr. Ryan has created. Um, now we'll actually formalize it into this industry document, the Code of Standards. How that Code of Standards becomes really relevant is more than just the racetracks that the Alliance is uh, um, publicly, obviously, engaging with, that list of 23 accredited racetracks. Um, there's also an awful lot of racetracks working towards that accreditation. But the other aspect um, where the Code of Standards becomes such a powerful implementation tool is that it creates this evolving standard of care. Nowadays, when something bad happens at a racetrack, someone's lawyer is saying, tell me about this alliance thing and this code of standards, because it's appearing in the litigation and the discovery process. So once the code of standards gets updated with a new protocol, believe me, um, the racetrack operators are taking deep interest because it's only a matter of time before they're going to hear about that protocol from someone's lawyer. No, I, I, I think these guys have certainly covered it. I, I would speak for the horse and just say, don't get on my back if, you're not, if your head's not straight. <laughs> okay, well, on behalf of the entire Louisville Forum, I'd like to thank all of our panelists today. And as an expression of our appreciation, we are going to make a donation to a local charity in their honor. And these are 10 charities that the board has pre-selected, so we will give a donation for each of our panelists. Our next program is going to be on Wednesday, June 12th, and the topic will cover vaccinations. So it should be exciting. Um, we hope that you'll join us. If you'd like to pre-register, you can, you can join us on our website at louisvilleforum.org, or you can make a reservation by calling 329-0111. Thank you all for being with us. <laughs>